Welcome to those of you just joining us. Um, we just finished our prayer. And um, I have the great privilege of introducing our speaker today, Sister Franca Zonta. Sister Franca is originally from Italy, which is where she joined the Marianist Sisters. In 2022, Sister Franca finished her term as the Superior General of the Marianist Sisters, a position which she had held since 2012. In her nearly 45 years of Marianist religious life, she has served as a teacher, novice director, and provincial of the province of Italy. In 2006, she was part of the founding group of the Marina Sisters Foundation in India. Sister Franca is also a much sought after presenter on the Marianist charism and is an expert on Blessed Marie of the Conception, whom we fondly refer to by her birth name, Adele de Bats de Tronquelion, or simply Mother Adele. In 2006, the North American Center of Marianist Studies published a book by Sister Franca titled After Adele, which is a history of the Marianist sisters from the death of Adele to the end of the 19th century. We are so grateful to have Sister Franca with us today, uh, joining us from Rome, as she talks about the significance of the Magnificat for Marianists. And so we welcome you and um, you can Go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby, for your um, kind presentation. And a, a big hello to everyone. Uh, and I thank you for the invitation to share some thoughts on such a beautiful topic, the Magnificat, and its meaning for the Marinese family. All of you who are here giving me your time, your listening, I am very grateful for that. And I will do my best to honor your presence. And before beginning, I would like to, to say a special thanks to, to Gabby and to brother Tim Phillips for their great help and support. Thank you very much. I am going now to share my my screen, so you can follow a little bit my presentation. Is it okay, Gabby? Yep, that looks good. Yep, perfect. Okay. okay. So, Magnificat, it is a, a great word. And for me, for everybody, I think analyzing words, their meaning, their origin, their context is always important. Magnificat, and uh, to magnify uh, means to, to make great, to glorify, extol, Proclaim the greatness of someone. And from the verb magnify comes the Latin adjective magnum. You know that, no? Which can be applied to things or people. And throughout uh, history, the adjective magnum, great, has been applied to people. We remember uh, Alexander the Great. Peter the Great, Charlemagne, etc. But also, uh, this can be applied to some aspects of a person. Indeed, it is said, a great intelligence, a magnanimous heart, etc. But it is uh, in a magnifying God and the works he has done and does that this verb finds its proper place. The Psalms and other books of, uh, of the Old Testament contain a treasure trove of expressions that seem of the greatness of God and his action on the world, and especially his presence in the lives of his creatures. 
in the Psalms we can find many, 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 and I'm not uh, going to to dwell on that, eh? but only to remember uh, one Psalm, and the Psalm 104, praise the Lord, my soul, O Lord, my God, you are great indeed. And we know very well how many Psalms are uh, singing the greatness of God. In the New Testament, the verb magnifying is rare. It is used in uh, Acts about Peter's baptism of the first Gentiles, when the Spirit descends on the uncircumcised, arousing the wonders of others. They heard them speaking in tongues and magnifying God. The translation often uses the term glorify or extol, but it is actually the same verb that Mary uses. Paul also uh, uses the same term in uh, the letter to the Philippians. Paul is in prison and writing to the Philippians, he will say, always Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. And magnifying the Lord presupposes knowing that he is always above us, greater than us. And those who feel loved, saved, forgiven, can only rejoice and magnify. In the text to the Colossians also, Paul invites Christians to praise God, to praise him by singing him, hymns and spiritual songs, singing from the heart. And singing characterizes the Christian and every human being who perceives the greatness of the Creator, anyone who perceives the presence of the being in whom we live and move and have our being. As it was also for the, the other biblical women, we remember Miriam, Moses' sister, who after the experience of deliverance after crossing the Red Sea, seen sings a song of praise and exaltation. Sing to the Lord, wonderful is his victory. We remember also Hannah, who gives praise to God for the gift of Samuel. My heart exalts in the Lord. My spirit is exalted in the Lord. Hannah. And the reason for rejoicing always lies in the strong and personal experience of the believer who experiences God's extraordinary action in his life. For Mary too, the reasons for her Magnificat lie outside her, lie in the one who did great works in her, unthinkable things, for nothing is impossible to God. The Magnificat is the song of Mary's ecstasy. It is not only Mary's soul that rejoices. Soul, in this context, means the being, the totality of Mary. It is Mary's whole life that exalts. And because she exalts, she exalts. She exalts the one who is at the origin of exultation. Mary does not exalt herself, even though she says, all generations will call me blessed and the Almighty has done great things for me. We know very well the text of the Magnificat. Mary exalts and magnifies the one who looked with favor on his lowly servant, raised up the humble, sent the rich away empty, 
has filled the hungry with good things, rescued Israel, his servant, etc. The Magnificat is not only, it's not just a song of praise, it is an explosion of praise. And one explodes when one can no longer hold something back. Feelings cannot be repressed, held back, whether negative or positive. They always find their own way out. When a feeling is strong, it explodes, erupt outwardly, involving everyone and everything. It is a, a torrent in flood, and we can say that Mary's soul is this torrent in flood because of God's gaze on her, the humble servant, pulling her to divine motherhood. There is one um, uh, beautiful uh, commentary, Luther uh, commentary on the Magnificat. And he has a very a nice, a beautiful expression I would like to share with you. Luther wrote, if one meditates on the divine deeds wholeheartedly and considers them with admiration and gratitude, he overflows with love and sighs more than he speaks. And the words flow forth on their own without being thought or studied. So that the spirit, the spirit himself is manifested and the words have life. This means truly praising God in spirit and truth. The words being fire, light, and life. As hot water boiling overflows and froats because it can no longer be held in the pot because of the great heat, of such kind are also all the words of the Blessed Virgin in this song. You and yet profound and great. St. Paul calls such people spiritu ferventes, fervent in spirit, in the letter to the Romans. The spiritually boiling and bubbling over and teaches us to be so. So Luther captures a primary, simple, fundamental dimension of the singing of the Magnificat which flows from a fervent, overflowing spirit, like the pot that can no longer hold all that is within it. This dimension of over, overflowing, of bubbling over, is something that must always characterize the redeemed person, because she or he has been filled with God's love. It is, uh, I think, very nice, this uh, image of Luther. Uh, hot water boiling, uh, overflowing from the pot. The Magnificat also, we can say, is the song of the humble. The song of those who feel small, who are helpless, because it is to them that God looks at. God watches, God sees the suffering of the people. God sees those who seek the first places and love to pray standing upright before all. God sees those who exalt themselves. God sees and his gaze rests on the little ones, on those who cannot speak, on those who have no defense but God, on the widow, 
who throws into the temple treasury all she has to live on. God set his gaze on Mary and her littleness, her availability, her total surrender to him. And for this very reason, he makes her the woman. The woman whom all generations will call blessed. God sees and intervenes. He intervenes by sending the rich away empty, raising up the lowly, and bringing down the arrogant and proud. God intervenes by coming into our midst. God intervenes by standing beside the little ones, the poor, the oppressed of every time and place. Magnifica, the song of the humble. Magnificat is the song of hope. And the song of hope that come, comes from the embrace of two women. Two women who carry life within them. It's very beautiful. A song coming from the embrace of two women. And it is in their wombs that the revolution of hope takes shape. It is a small, fragile hope, as is every child that is born. But it is a hope that is rooted in the depths of the womb, which is why hope is actually a strong virtue. It is a prophecy of a future that is rooted on the memory of the past. God has visited his people. The embrace of two women. I would like to quote from Pope Francis from a homily that he uh, gave uh, on August 15, the, on the solemnity of the Assumption. We heard the song of Mary, the Magnificat. It is the song of hope. It is the song of the people of God walking through history. It is the song of many saints, men and women. They say also, Shaminat, Adele, Therese. These have faced the struggle of life while carrying in their heart the hope of the little and the humble. Mary says, my soul glorifies the Lord. Today, the church too sings this in every part of the world. And this song is particularly strong in places where the body of Christ is suffering the passion. For us Christians, wherever the cross is, there is hope. Always. If there is no hope, we are not Christians. And Mary is always there, near those communities, near our brothers and sisters. She accompanies them, suffers with them, and sings the Magnificat of hope with them. Pope Francis. And now let's, let's come to the Marianist family Magnificat. I don't know if I am able to say something, but I, I tried and I shared with you my thoughts on that. For Father Shaminad, uh, for his uh, Marian theology, uh, scripture and especially the Gospel of Luke is uh, fundamental, is central. Father Bertrand and Bubi, I, I think many of you knew him, was fond of saying that if there was no Gospel of Luke, the Society of Mary would not exist. <laughs> I don't know if this is true, but he was 
he was repeating many times this. Uh, he knew very well um, Shaminad's Marian theology. Uh, the text of the Annunciation is the most quoted in the founders' Marian writings. It is cited uh, 43 times. And the second most quoted text is the Magnificat, 19 times in the Marian writings. And what was the significance according to Shaminad? The founder notes that these first words of the Song of Mary contain the feelings of her personal gratitude. Let us notice first that Mary, in the midst of all her transports of love and gratitude, sees herself only as the humblest of the Lord's servants. It is even this conviction which increases her feelings. Second, that while she is absorbed, absorbed in joy, it is not in herself nor for herself that she rejoices, but in God, the sole author of her salvation. Mary's words contain a prophecy. The Marian writings, the first volume. And he did not tire of repeating that it was necessary to form well, to extract beaucoup en français, uh, beaucoup, beaucoup, <laughs> the sodalist and novices about Mary. Chaminade was repeating all the time that it was important to know Mary, to imitate Mary in order to arrive at conformity with her son, Jesus. He wrote, we can read in the Marian writings, it is necessary to instruct a lot about the Blessed Virgin. The general plan of these instructions would be based on five topics. First, what Mary was eternally in the ideas of God. Second, the virtues of Mary in general and in particular. Third, her power. Fourth, her mercy. And the last, her glory. And he was also adding we cannot learn too much about the greatness of Mary, divine greatness, the workings of the Almighty. He who is mighty has done great things for me. So Shaminad was uh, insisting a lot. Uh, we have to, to learn, to study, to know, and we need to instruct a lot about Mary. So Mary in the Magnificat proclaims God's greatness. We can and should, according to the founder, speak of Mary's greatness because God has done great things in her. And to speak of Mary's greatness is ultimately to speak of God's greatness, of his infinite mercy. And what about Adele? We, in reality, we do not find much in Mother Adele's letter about uh, the Magnificat, other than her uh, one recommendation, one recommendation to the superior of the community in Tonnes, not to sing during Vespers, except the Ave Maristella and the Magnificat. These, uh, we remember, uh, were times when tuberculosis was reaping its victims. And the sisters were often out of strength and exhausted. Adele also died for that. So hence the recommendation to spare the voice, but not for the Magnificat, which had to be sung. So Adele, she does not speak much of the Magnificat, but, but the spirit of exultation 
and gratitude to God for the works he had done was deep in Adele's heart. So the spirit of the Magnificat was deep in Adele's heart. Adele rejoiced for the gift of friendship. She rejoiced anytime she could speak of God or hear others speaking of him. She exulted with joy when she could approach the Eucharist. So Adele lived the spirit of the Magnificat by cultivating a praising heart. And this comes out very clearly in her letters. To live the spirit of the Magnificat is to live as prophets. Chaminade also spoke about that. No? The Magnificat contains a prophecy. A prophet is one who sees God's action, God's presence, even when reality seems to hide it, when reality seems to say the opposite. To be a prophet is to lay upon the world and people the very gaze of God. It is to see the goodness, the beauty, present in every corner of the universe. A beauty that radiates and uh, that no one can block. Who can block the light? Clouds can dim it, but not eliminate it. So it is of the beauty and goodness present in every living being created in the image and likeness of God. To live the spirit of the Magnificat is to have this gaze that knows how to go beyond and see the seedling where there is still only the seed. It is to have this positive gaze that offers confidence, hope to those who walk with difficulty beside us. The spirit of the Magnificat, as I said, was deeply rooted in Adele, who knew how to see the positive in every friend, sister, person, situation. Adele, Adele was known and sought after for her great goodness, which consisted precisely in this. She saw the good, she gave confidence, she encouraged, she had a firm conviction that God continued to do great things. Adele defended, excused those who were accused and emphasized the positive aspects of the person accused. This is what she did with the sisters, with the, her friends, and this is what she did also with Father Shaminad when someone had a complaint about him saying that he was forgetting the sisters, not helping them enough, using the sisters' money for the needs of the booming society of Mary. Adele, without hesitation, took the founder's side, emphasizing his great fatherly heart, which was far from forgetting his daughters. We can ask to ourselves, what prophets are we? Prophets of doom who see only negativity and hardship or prophets of hope who see goodness and beauty emerging everywhere, even if fragile as a blade of grass. That blade of grass needs my care today to become the tree that tomorrow will give shade, bear fruit.
the Marianist family today lends Mary its voice to raise this canticle of praise, rejoicing, hope, and victory. And it is uh, beautiful, it is meaningful, it is prophetic, I think, to unite the whole Marianist family in the canticle of the Magnificat on the first Friday of each month, remembering what our brothers and sisters do in the world alongside the poor, the oppressed, the marginalized, the forgotten of history. In my opinion, I think uh, uh, too little is known about the Marianist Magnificat. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I think uh, we, we can do more. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, um, the Marianist family knows enough about this beautiful initiative. And it is uh, significant to see scrolling through the index of the Marianist Magnificat, once called Friday Magnificat, how sensitivity has evolved and how projects aimed at peace and ecological conversion, conversion are increasing. I went to the index and it is um, interesting to see how things are evolving. The sensitivity is changing. Magnificat is a song of victory. And singing the Magnificat with Mary was for Father Chaminade to sing her greatness, to sing Mary's power against the forces of evil. All of us, we remember uh, what he wrote in the letter to the retreat masters on August 24, 1839. Mary's power is not diminished. A great victory is reserved to Mary today. It is up to her to conquer the heresy of our day, as she has conquered all the heresies of the past. For Father Chaminade and Adele and Therese, the heresy of their day was that of religious indifference, loss of faith. Faith was dying. So we can ask to ourselves, what is the heresy of our days? It is a good question in my opinion, no? today. What is the heresy that we have to fight helping Mary in her mission? Heresy means being outside the truth, having an erroneous, erroneous, false, unsustainable belief. And I think that everything, anything that goes against the human person their dignity, anything that goes, that goes against life is, in a sense, a heresy. It is the heresy against which we must commit ourselves in the name and for the glory of God. In the certainty that Mary is the woman destined to crush the head of the serpent to use an image dear to the founder. So many can be the areas in which we can commit ourselves as a Marianist family. The list of projects completed in recent years demonstrate this. However, let me point to one of the Iranian heresies today against which the Marianist family could stand beside Mary in order to fight it. 
the totalitarianism of single thinking, the totalitarianism of the virtual world that erases the boundaries between reality and illusion. I remember Gandhi's words, and I think they were prophetic and timely. Gandhi say, said, modern civilization has taught us to trade night for day and unrestrained noise for golden silence. And I would like now to quote, uh, in my opinion, a beautiful idea, thought of Hannah Arendt, a great philosopher, you know her, who had to flee from Nazi totalitarianism. Yesterday we celebrated the Memorial Day. Uh, so today I am happy to, to quote. Hannah Arendt, and she argues that the perfect subject in a totalitarian regime is not the convinced Nazi, it is not the convinced communist, but the one who can no longer distinguish true from false, reality from fiction. And how to educate, how to train these perfect subjects by taking away their ability to have spaces of solitude, spaces in which to meet with themselves, spaces in which to dialogue with the innermost part of themselves. Taking away their ability to have spaces of solitude. And yes, we can see uh, nowadays our senses find themselves like in the public square at the mercy of the bombardment of social media and advertising, etc., which stimulates them relentlessly, producing sensations, feelings, fantasies, desires, and it actually prevents deep thinking. And in the musical score of the times in which we are living, there is a lack of pauses, a lack of silences, a lack of keys to read the notes exactly. And what comes out, you can imagine, is certainly not a harmony. Helping to recover spaces of solitude, not isolation, educating to silence, fostering an encounter with oneself, this is an urgent task as disciples of Shaminad and Adel. Today, as yesterday, l'essentiel, c'est l'intérieur. The essential is the interior, as the founder used to say. Today, as yesterday, it is important to reclaim one's self. The essential is the interior. And let me quote a very beautiful page from the diary of Eti Hillesum, a Jewish victim of the Holocaust in the crematorium of Auschwitz. She died when she was 29 years old. She wrote in her diary, she was in the concentration camp. And we can imagine what was a concentration camp. And in her diary, she wrote, My God, I promise you one thing, one little thing. I will try to help you 
so that you will not be destroyed within me. The only thing we can save these days is a little piece of you in ourselves. And perhaps we can also help unearth you from the hearts of other people. You may experience lean times with me, my God. Times poorly fueled by my poor faith, but believe me, I will continue to work for you and be faithful to you, and I will not let you leave my territory. It is up to us to help you to defend to the last your house in us. To defend our territory, to defend God's house in us. Very beautiful. And if you, uh, I invite you to read the diary. If you didn't read yet, it is a very beautiful reading, profound reading. So this is the victory song that as a Marianist family, we can help to intone the regaining of one's inner territory. And at the same time, it is also important to reappropriate time. And here again, uh, here again, um, I would like to share with you a beautiful page from Seneca to his friend Lucilius concerning time. My dear Lucilius, set yourself free for your own sake. Gather and save your time, which till lately has been forced from you. Make yourself believe the truth of my words, that certain moments are torn from us, that some are gently removed and that others glide beyond our reach. The most disgraceful kind of loss, however, is that due to carelessness. Furthermore, if you will pay close heed to the problem, you will find that the largest portion of our life passes while we are doing ill, a goodly share while we are doing nothing, and the whole while we are doing that which is not to the purpose. What man can you show me who places any value on his time, who reckons the worth of each day, who understands that he is dying daily? For we are mistaken when we look forward to death. The major portion of death has already passed. Whatever years lie behind us are in death's hands. Therefore, Lucilius, hold every hour in your grasp. Lay hold of today's task, and you will not need to depend so much upon tomorrow's. While we are postponing our acting, life speeds by. Nothing, Lucilius, is ours except time. We were entrusted by nature with the ownership of this single thing, so fleeting and slippery that anyone, whoever wants to, can take it away from us. Nothing is ours except time. And we can resonate Mother Adele's words, time passes, let us hasten to put it to good use. 
time is greater than space, says the first of the four principles of Pope Francis. Time is greater than space. So we are the guardians of time given to us. We are sentinels called to be vigilant. We are called to regain spaces of interiority because it is from there that we can build a culture of encounter, a more just fraternal world, a world where we rediscover the beauty of being brothers and sisters. To build a more just and fraternal world. And I quote from Father Andre Fetis, circular number three. The aspiration, the call, and the capacity to live fraternity are inscribed in the heart of every human being. Everywhere, in all places, in all cult cultures, whatever their faith, the construction of fraternity is a common objective and a privileged ground for encounter among all. I go to the conclusion. Uh, thank you for your patience. So history, as I said, is the musical score where the notes of the Magnificat continue to resonate in the hearts of the humble, the weak, and the oppressed of all times. Looking to Mary, suffering humanity, disappointed by the powerful of the day, can continue to intone the Magnificat in the certainty that God's will be the last word, a word of liberation and hope. The song of the Magnificat is placed by Luke on the mouth of Mary when everything has yet to take place. Mary stands before us as the one who, even before the birth of her son, even before she knows how the game will play out, already magnifies the Lord. Her trust is total. God keeps his promises. So this is the characteristics that should dwell within us, we sons and daughters of Mary, family of Mary. To be willing to sing, to praise, to magnify, to exalt him for whom everything is easy. As the Surah of Mary in the Quran says, I like this, uh, this sentence that we can find in the Quran, everything is easy for God. Every member of the Marinist family can and must walk quickly through the mountains of Judea, the mountains of challenges that make our journey more arduous and uphill to meet our brothers and sisters with whom we can sing our Magnificat because of our hearts overflowing, like the pot, <laughs> with gratitude and trust. God continues doing great things. Holy is his name. But what a magnifica to see. Can we see on the horizon of history the victory of God and humanity over the weaknesses and evil that afflict, burden and crush so many of our brothers and sisters today? What a magnifica to see. And I now invite you to a moment of silence and prayer. I invite you to read what will appear on the screen, this proposed possible Magnificat that I, and I hope we, would like to sing with Mary today.
So for each of us to continue Mary's Magnifica today, to continue to sing the Magnificat, not only in song, but in life and in the concrete actions of every day, whether small or big. Let life sing Magnificat. Let it be our life which sings Magnificat. Mary continues to be a source of inspiration, not only in the Christian world, the Muslim world too, sees in Mary, in Maryam, the strong woman, the mother. An Iranian film about Maryam is becoming very popular among Muslims. And we are glad to see that our Muslim brothers and sisters are proposing a form of liberation Mariology, arguing that Mary, because of her autonomy, strength and spirituality, should be considered the prophet of the third millennium. So Mary's family, the young woman of Nazareth, needs you, needs me, needs us to be this prophet of the third millennium. And let me conclude quoting Pope Francis. Dear brothers and sisters, with all our heart, let us too unite ourselves to this song of patience and victory, of struggle and joy, that unites the triumphant church with the pilgrim one, earth with heaven, and that joins our lives to the eternity towards which we journey. Amen. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your patience. <laughs> uh, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to share with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, so much wisdom, I think, to, to really reflect on. Um, so what we're going to do now is uh, we have a little bit of time for uh, asking questions and just to um, structure our time well what I'd invite you to do is if you have a question for Sister Franca or even a you know a short comment I invite you to send that to me and um, to NACMAS host in the chat and then when I see those, I will invite you to unmute yourself um, and you can, you can ask Sister Franca. So we can take a moment to do that. Um, I'll start us off while people are thinking, just to give you some time to think with a question. So Sister Franca, what is your advice for someone trying to cultivate the interior life? because you mentioned that of, of really defending our interior spaces. What advice would you give to someone starting that journey? Beautiful question, Gabby. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is important to create opportunity for um, uh, to experience silence, to experience a um, moment on which we can go inside us. You know? So in the experience, so we cannot uh, um, speak about, we need to make the other person experience silence, experience the solitude that is not isolation. Uh, so to be there, that person, uh, accompany the person, but um, create the experience. So in our community, we need to create spaces, uh, time um, for that. 
open our doors, uh, not only for, um, yeah, everything is important. And it's also to, to, to share, to speak, to, but also to experience silence, moment of silence. And the young people in a special way, they appreciate that. Uh, not only the young people, everyone. <laughs> so in, in our community, we have every week, um, we open our doors, we have um, adoration in silence. And uh, now the people, nearby people, our neighbor, uh, we put outside the, the advertising. <laughs> So they know that uh, they can um, come for five minutes, for 10 minutes, half an hour, and experience silence in our chapel. So we, we cannot speak about silence. We need to experience silence. Mm. Thank you. But maybe others can also uh, say something different so we can help each other. Yes, if somebody has um, a thought about that, I invite you to put that in the chat as well. Um, we received, uh, there's one, one person says that they will be reflecting on examining what they are allowing to be the soundtrack of their life and that this makes them think of the system of virtues. So just to thank you for that image for reflection. So um, we have a question. Um, this is from Alex. And so he asks, in our very divided world, how can we use the Magnificat to bring people and communities together with those who do not share our religious or political perspective? And especially in a way that does not alienate those who have been harmed by the church people who feel alienated by the church. So how can the Magnificat be something that can bring people together? Yeah, this is also a good question. Uh, we need to live the spirit of the Magnificat. Uh, so uh, it is uh, the spirit that is important. And to live the spirit of Magnificat is to be able to see uh, the positivity in our world, uh, as, I, as I said. So this is for everyone, not only for Christians. So it, this, it is one attitude that we need to, to cultivate in us, to be able to see the, the beauty, um, to see the hope, to see... Um, and everywhere we can see that. So we need to help each other to have a positive attitude uh, and, um, and to fight also. Uh, the Magnificat is also a song of victory. Now to see the victory, um, yes, we can see that uh, um, people are suffering. There are many evil things and many we cannot see the victory in reality in uh, many situations. But uh, if there is one person fighting against that, this is a, a way to see the Magnificat. Fighting against the injustice, against the, um, oh, everything that is against the human being to fight for the human rights, to stand beside the poor, the marginalized. This is a way to see the Magnificat. So it is uh, to live the spirit of the Magnificat. Um, it is not to, uh, as I said, the mother Adela in her letters, almost uh, we can find nothing about, but she was living the spirit of Magnificat. Uh, always able to see the positivity in 
every friend, every sister, because she was able to encourage. So to encourage other is uh, singing the Magnificat, because you can see that uh, to give the other uh, to the other person the opportunity to change, to believe that the other person can change. This is a, a way to sing Magnificat. Thank you for the question. Yeah, Alex? <laughs> I think um, just one a quick uh, comment just related to your interior, talking about guarding our interior spaces um, and the Magnificat. When I think about what you made me reflect on was how Mary had this beautiful song outpouring from her. I would imagine that she spent a, a great period of time in silence, like maybe, and even in her traveling to Elizabeth, that perhaps that song was only able to come from her because of this time that she spent in silence. And I think that that's something we can also uh, learn from. Just a comment from um, Brother David Betts. He says that I find that your comment on the visitation scene, the embrace of two women, as a revolution of hope is fascinating. I see revolution as an overturning of the old to bring about the new and a powerful image to look upon the humble to bring this about the two women meeting. He says, thank you for that insight. Any other questions or comments before we uh, bring our time together to a close? Well, um, I want to thank you, Sister Franca, so much for being with us. This has been um, really a very fruitful time. Um, and I think that you've given a lot of us many things to reflect on. Um, the last comment that we have is from Sister Laura Lemming. She says that Mary sang about things that weren't happening yet. And I think we have a great challenge to keep that. And I think that's a great point to really keep that in mind for the future to, um, that it is a song of hope, as you said. So thank you, thank you for, for those insights. Um, before we thank conclude, thank I you, just... thank you, Gabby, and thank you to everyone for listening to me. Thank you, and uh, best wishes, wishes to all, to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. And just before we conclude, I just wanted to share with you um, what's coming next in our Magnificat series at NACMIS. Um, so our next program presentation is on Thursday, February 23rd. Um, that's at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And that is on the Magnificat and Mary's Universality that we actually have a, the title is slightly different. Um, and at this point, because it's been updated since then, but this is a presentation by Dr. Naomi Deanda, who is a professor at the University of Dayton and a, um, a lay Marianist. And this will be, I'm really interested to see actually what she's going to talk about. Um, it'll be an interactive presentation and it'll be focused on um, images of Mary, particularly Our Lady of Guadalupe, and then various images of Mary nursing. And that's one of the things that she studies as a theologian at UD is, is um, the theology of, of Mary um, nursing Jesus. So we have that and registration information will be coming out for that in the next couple of days. So please look for that um, in your email and on social media. We have uh, in March, there's a, a virtual retreat afternoon related to the Magnificat. So stay tuned for that. Um, and we have a panel about the Magnificat and social justice because it is just this really powerful song of, of justice, about God's justice. And we have um, a variety of people on that panel. 
mainly from the Marianist Social Justice Collaborative. Um, so that'll be a great group and good conversation. And then we will finish our Magnificat series with a um, day long and evening uh, virtual writing workshop about the Magnificat. So um, we're really excited for these programs and I hope that you consider joining some of these. Um, and if you wanna stay updated on that, please go to nacmas.org. Make sure you're signed up for our newsletter um, and you will be up to date with all of the programs. So thank you again for joining us and thank you, Sister Franca. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evenings, days, wherever you are. Thank you, thank you very thank much, you. thank you. Thank you and greetings to all.